Welcome to Clause 8. I'm Eli Mazur, and today we're lucky to be joined by Aaron Cooper. Aaron was the chief counsel for IP and antitrust law on the Senate Judiciary Committee during the passage of the American Invents Act, and is now the head of global policy for the trade group BSA. The AAIA arguably made the most substantial changes to patent law since the Patent Act of 1836, and today we will be discussing the passage of AIA, his current work at BSA, and many other issues. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you very much for having me. So I wanted to start really talking a little bit about your background, but really your patent background. Do you remember when you first became aware of patents in childhood and college and law school? And I guess, what did you think about them at the time? It was definitely college and law school. In law school, I actually did not take a class on intellectual property. I was focusing primarily on an interest in communications law, which is what I actually started practicing when I went to Covington and Burling as an associate after law school. But as I started to deal with communications law issues and I was learning about that aspect of communications, there's certainly a lot of copyright issues and then a lot of patent issues that are involved. I mean, I became more and more interested in it. And when I had the chance to work on the Senate Judiciary Committee to be involved in a range of intellectual property issues, uh, it's a brand new vocabulary. You have to learn the system. But the only thing that's rocket science is rocket science and everything else you can learn if you spend enough time with experts who can try to help you understand both how the system is intended to work and how different industries experience that system and the problems and the advantages that they see in it. Why did you decide to make that jump from private practice to Capitol Hill at that time? Well, it was a tremendous opportunity. I actually started by working for Senator Sarbanes, who was a senator from Maryland who was retiring at the time that I'd taken the position with him. But that was a great introduction to doing good substantive work on the Hill. Senator Sarbanes was a fantastic senator and great to learn from. And that led to an opportunity working for Senator Leahy, who at the time was the ranking member of the Senate Judiciary Committee and about six months later became chairman of the committee. And it's just a tremendous opportunity and a sense of real patriotism to be able to work not just in that building, but I was very fortunate to work for Senator Sarbanes and Senator Leahy, who really took their role as leaders in the Senate seriously. Senator Leahy was ultimately the Senate pro tem, which means he was the most senior member of the party who was in charge. And he took the institution of the Senate seriously. And it's just an honor to get to work for him. And I was fortunate to be able to work on intellectual property issues, which I ended up loving. I think it was a great learning experience for me, but it was a combination of fascinating issues and being able to work for and with people who really took their roles seriously and tried to hear all sides and not everybody was going to agree, but it's just a wonderful experience and opportunity. I wanted to talk a little bit about your role as the chief counsel. How were your priorities set in terms of these are the issues that we'll be focusing on? This is the legislation. These are the, I guess, public relations efforts. How was that set? Was that by Senator Leahy? Was that the Obama administration coming in? How did those things, I guess, come about? It's a combination of things, uh, but we'll just take patent laws as, as an example, yeah. but this would be true in a lot of areas. Senator Leahy, particularly when he became chairman and was able to set the agenda, would say to us, here are my overall priorities. Let's figure out plans to achieve those. And among his plans and priorities was to reform the patent system. It started as a bipartisan project in about 2005, 2006, around the time that I was starting to work there before I was the chief IP counsel. And Senator Leahy, Senator Hatch, and, and others started working on bipartisan legislation, trying to hear all sides, but with an objective to try to make sure that where there was inefficiencies, particularly as a result of patents of low quality being misused in the system, try to figure out ways that we can avoid that happening in the future. And we'll talk about, obviously, AI at more length, but I'm just curious, how does Senator Leahy, for example, become aware that's a problem? Does he see it on TV? Is it because he has a former staffer who's now working for a trade group? How does Senator Leahy start thinking about that that's a problem? Yeah, so it's a combination of factors. So he will, and this will be true for other senators as well, but they'll hear from people in different industries about how they're experiencing the system. It might not just be about the patent system. You might hear about the tax system, about international trade and so on. But one that came within his jurisdiction would be the patent system, be true in copyrights as well. And it would combine that with what at the staff level we were hearing from different industry groups. And from that develop first a decision as to whether it was worth investigating whether legislation made sense. And second, 
whether we could put together legislation that actually had a chance of changing and improving the system. But it would be a combination of hearing directly from industry participants, particularly industry participants in Vermont, which is where Senator Leahy was from, and combine that with the information that we were getting from different industry groups that would come in and talk to us about either the problems or the advantages of the way the current system was working. And let's say you're a business owner out in Houston, Texas, and you've never been involved in the DC lobbying or advocacy process. What would you recommend would be a first good step to get something on the radar of the right congressman or senator? Is it try to create a grassroots movement or is it try to go talk to their office? Where would you start? It's a great question. And I actually have had a lot of conversations with individuals, not just in Texas, although Texas actually is a state where I would hear from people individually, but certainly did from Vermont and and in other places where I'd say there, there are two or three different things. One, it's important to know that you can always pick up the phone and call your senator and ask to speak to the relevant staff. And I was surprised at how few people took advantage of that in this area. Because when I was able to speak with people one-on-one, they wouldn't always agree with what Senator Leahy was doing on this issue in particular. Some would, some wouldn't. But having that direct communication about why we were trying to do what we were trying to do, I think was helpful for everybody. Often, if one company in Houston, Texas is experiencing problems, other participants in that same industry are experiencing the same problem. And given the size of the country, it is helpful if you can join forces with other companies that are experiencing that same problem, if it's a problem, and using that avenue through a trade association, through a coalition of like-minded companies to bring an issue to a member's attention. It's not that it won't get to the member's attention if you do it individually, but it's, it's helpful, I think, on the legislature side to know that it's not just one company experiencing this issue, but that it is a lot of them. And I think that was really effective during the time that I worked there. After I left the Innovation Act, I think in large part came about, or a lot of the push for it was retailers that were all experiencing a problem and they had been calling one by one and they started banding together and calling as a group. And I think that helped spur a lot of the momentum. I guess overall, how would you describe the awareness regarding patent issues among senators? Well, it varies. It varies a lot. There are senators who worked in the IP field before they became senators. And Senator Chris Coons is a good example of that. There are members of the House who also with experience both as inventors and dealing with intellectual property in their businesses prior to getting to the Hill. But it's certainly a wide variety. And you think about the number of issues that members of Congress have to deal with, in addition to making sure that they are attuned to everything that's happening in their district or their state, there's no way to be an expert on everything. And as a result, one of the things that both the House and the Senate do is they break up jurisdiction of specific issues into different committees. So for instance, patent issues come under the jurisdiction of the Senate Judiciary Committee. And so members of that committee that have been there for a while will have more familiarity with some of these issues in the legislative context, because that's where the hearings are going to be. That's where the legislative debate is going to be. And the more likely a bill is to move on an issue, even if it's somebody who is not focused on patent issues or IP issues in the past, they will get up to speed quickly because they know it's going to come up for consideration. And as a result, one of the things that I used to do as committee counsel was to make sure that if we were going to be suggesting that the committee consider patent-related legislation, that we held hearings leading up to it, partly as an educational matter for members and staff that, that are focusing on so many different issues to know this was coming up. And interestingly, the passage of AIA, the legislative effort, almost perfectly coincided with your time working for Senator Leahy. Take us back to the time, 2005, 2006, What was the general sense of how the patent system was doing in Congress, or maybe specifically, what was Senator Leahy thinking at the time? So I started with Senator Leahy in 2006, and I was not the chief IP counsel at the time, but I was part of some of those conversations. And it really started from a National Academies report and a report from the FTC about issues in the patent system. And they made recommendations along the line of moving to first to file. And they made recommendations about the creation of a post-grant review system different than the existing ex parte and inter parte re-exam system. And I think those recommendations and concerns about misuse of patents, particularly within the tech sector, caused a lot of buzz and interest in seeing if there were ways that we could correct for some of those structural problems without causing unintended consequences. And a large part of the process that went into everything between 2005 and enactment in 2011 was continuing to iterate 
to try to figure out when an industry would come and say, the way you've drafted the legislation today is going to have these unintended consequences. See if those are consequences that we could address in order to avoid them while still achieving the overall objective of improving the quality of patents, improving the structure of the patent system, and reducing the ability to misuse patents. I guess when you started working for the committee, did you know that this was going to be a big focus of your work? And did you think it's going to take this long, or did you think it might take even longer? What was your sense about the effort in the beginning? That's a good question. It's really hard to predict these things. I think one of the things that made the AIA possible was that we had senators and members of Congress that were willing to work across the aisle and try to find solutions and not just be ideological about what had to be changed in order for a bill to move forward. And that dynamic, I think, gave all of us some optimism that it was worth working on year after year after year to try to continue to improve it. One of the things that Senator Leahy said frequently towards the end of the process, as we were going to votes on the Senate floor on it, was that it's not the bill that he would have drafted on his own. And with his counterpart, Senator Kyle, Senator Grassley, Senator Sessions, and Senator Hatch, all worked on the Republican side, Senator Cornyn, very closely with him on the patent bill. He would also say, it's not, I'm sure it's not the bill that they would have written, but it's the ability to compromise and try to make as many changes that overall improve the system as possible that made it worth doing and made it possible. I think the number of years is about right for the size of the bill. It, as long as members of Congress and industry are all willing to continue to work together to try to iron out differences, it still takes a while. One of the hardest things in D.C. is getting a bill to the Senate floor, but being able to come to enough of a consensus to move it forward always seems achievable. And so the members were happy to keep working on it. And you mentioned, and it seemed like the initial impetus, at least the way it got on Senator Leahy's radar, was the reports from FTC and the National Academy of Science. And I'm guessing that was part of the reports, but in the pop culture, and that from that perspective, there was a lot of talk about quote unquote patent trolls. And it seemed almost to reach some kind of hysteria at that point. What role did that play in those efforts to pass the AI? Yeah, that was definitely a big part of it. I think one of the big animating concerns was that patents were being misused, that the remedies were not being set at a reasonable royalty rate, that injunctions were too easy to get, that patents were too hard to challenge. And I think that animated a lot of the debate. But then what took all the time was trying to figure out how can we try to address some of those legitimate concerns without overcorrecting such that those that are doing the research and development and getting patents and legitimately licensing them and need to make sure that they're enforceable are able to do that. And I think ultimately the goal is to try to come up with a system where if you have a truly novel, non-obvious invention, that it's easy to enforce that claim. But if you have an overbroad, probably not novel claim that there's an efficient way of challenging it, and it just takes a while to get to that point where you're getting as close to that formula as possible. Something else that I found interesting about you saying that it's really that National Academy of Science report and that FTC report, which got on Senator Leahy's radar, it seems like, let's say, that hypothetical business owner in uh, Texas, it might be more effective for me to spend my time lobbying FTC and National Academy of Science to put out a report than it would be a senator who has a hundred of other issues on his plate. Is that a takeaway from this whole? No, I, I think it's a combination of things because members were hearing directly from their constituents. They're hearing from industry groups on behalf of their constituents. And at the same time, two respected governmental entities were putting out reports suggesting changes to the system. And it's that confluence okay. that I think led a lot of members to be interested in working on so I think you touched upon it, but uh, Representative Lamar Smith and Senator Leahy and Senator Hatch, I believe, put out really the first versions of those bills. What organizations had the most influence, I guess, in what was in those initial versions of the bill? And from a practical standpoint, how did ideas become legislative language? Yeah. It's a combination of things, just like what the impetus for the legislation in the first place is a combination. So there were recommendations from national academies that ended up in the bill, things about switching to first inventor to file, having a post-grant review process that's the oppositional proceeding. But then those get combined with talking to industry groups that we knew would be interested in changes to the patent system early on. So talking to organizations like BSA, where I am now, companies that are heavily involved in the patent system and we try to reach as many different industry sectors as possible to, to begin with because we know that ultimately 
We're going to need to make sure that a new system works for all different industry sectors. But to get everybody focused, legislation often takes a while to get companies and industries focused. But for those who were willing to participate early on, we're taking Senator Leahy and Senator Hatch and folks in the House, we're taking on those industry comments and trying to work them in. But knew that, for instance, I think when the first bill was Lamar Smith and Howard Berman on the House side, I think that they said on the record that they knew that this was just the beginning of a process because they hadn't been able to hear from everybody. And But having a bill introduced helps focus different industry groups, different companies, your friend from Houston, Texas, and it gets everybody to participate more and to comment. And then you can figure out how to address those issues as best you can after legislation's been introduced. From a practical standpoint, is it some council on the committee who puts that all together and takes a stab at it? And then how does that practically happen? Or does a lobbyists help them out? Because you hear stories like, the lobbyists just gave the bill to the congressman, then he introduced that. But it doesn't sound, you know. I'm sure in some contexts, things like that happen. That's not how this happened. This was a combination of bipartisan counsel. So I was not part of drafting the first one. But it, the way it worked in every iteration that I worked on, compromises in 2007, we had another compromise in 2009, 2010, and then 2011 before it got done. I would sit in rooms for a long time with counsel for my Republican counterparts and my House counterparts on both the Democrat and Republican side. And we would all sit down and try to work through what provisions should look like. Then we would get feedback from industry, from government, spent a lot of time with the PTO. The, one of the big deal, one of the times where we had a compromise that helped move the ball forward a lot was in, I think it was 2000. Nine, right after Dave Kapos became PTO director. And Senator Kyle at the time had asked Senator Leahy, who was chairman, if as soon as Dave Kapos was confirmed as director, let's have our staff sit down with Kapos and his team and work out what's workable for the PTO and what isn't. We did that along with our House counterparts as soon as Kapos was confirmed. We spent a lot of time trying to make sure the post-grant and inter-parties review system were written in a way that Kapos' team felt was implementable in a way that would work. That kind of back and forth is how the different versions of the bill come forward. Is there any, I guess, private organization outside of government or any particular people that stand out in terms of having a lot of influence on the bill or their people who were trusted and listened to because of their experience from any trade organization? Yeah, I think there are coalitions that formed that were going to advocate really strongly on different aspects of the bill. What I always found most helpful was when the counsel for some of the companies Usually the chief IP counsel would spend the time with us and try to work through what we were trying to accomplish and why the way we were trying to accomplish it might cause unintended consequences. And sometimes that was easiest on one-off basis, one-off conversations. Sometimes it was helpful to have five or six different IP councils in the room with bipartisan staff so that we could have a back and forth about different ways that we could try to change provisions to address concerns. But it, Getting that kind of deep expertise was really helpful, and the PTO in this process was extremely helpful as well at trying to help us sort through what different proposed changes that different industry groups would like to see how they were going to play out at the PTO. And I found something interesting that you wrote about the passage of the AIA. You said, companies focused on IP with large DC presences followed the AIA processes and knew when enacted it would create significant changes for how they protected their inventions. Many independent inventors and innovative small businesses have ever had their focus, not surprisingly, elsewhere on research, development, and customer base. Is that a dynamic that I guess, for example, I imagine Senator Leahy was aware of, especially from a state like Vermont, where you don't think of it as large tech companies being there. You think of more independent inventors than there are large tech companies. Well, what I think happens is that in every state, you're going to have companies that are on all sides of patent issues. Yeah. And one of the things that I think made compromise possible is that they're often on different sides of patent policy issues, not because they are adversarial, but because the way their business model works, they experience the patent system in different ways. And there are going to be bad actors on all sides, right? But if you just listen to the actors that are really trying to do it right, whether it's the independent inventor who's patenting and trying to license, or whether it's the implementer who really looks at a patent claim and thinks this is not what my product does, it doesn't read on my product. If you take uh, those 
good actors that just experience the patent system in different ways and they're not adversarial in a specific litigation or something like that, then you can try to find ways that address both sets of concerns. But it takes a lot of time of working with them to try to iron that out and figure out how can we help everybody see that what one company is advocating is not in order to try to screw over the other company, but that you're just experiencing the patent world in very different ways. And improving that communication can help solve a lot of those problems. Right. But I guess based on what you wrote, it seems that those theoretical small independent inventors, it wasn't even on their radar about what could occur. Was it on Congress's radar that even though they're not paying attention, it might hurt them in this and this way? So one of the things that is instrumental to the process is making sure that we're as public as possible when trying to work on and pass legislation, because that's the way to attract interest and attention in what you're doing so that you can get as many good comments as possible. Every industry is affected by changes in the intellectual property system, but not every industry is focused on IP all the time. So if you're a small business owner, you're probably not for the most part thinking about how changes in the IP system might affect you. And what we tried to do over and over again was to be as loud as one can be about changes in the patent law. It wasn't until the AIA was almost done that you would actually see stories in the front page of the New York Times about patents, but otherwise that's not where stories on patent law come out. But do as best we can on outreach to try to get as many comments as possible. But it's not until legislation's really moving that you can get enough attention to really get everybody from different communities focused on it. I guess two last topics about the passage of AIA that I guess I found interesting about reading about it. One, there was an interesting dynamic. Senator Tom Coburn, he was really focused on ending fee diversions from Pan office. And he refused to vote for a final version of the bill because it didn't have that in there. At the same time, the main opponent of that was Congressman Paul Ryan, who's the head of a budget committee. As an outsider, you think of them, they're both conservative Republicans, and yet they were staunchly on different sides of that issue. Do you have a memory of that? Yes. I feel a fee diversion was a really big issue throughout the AIA process. And when, when what became the AIA went through the Senate Judiciary Committee the last time, we worked with Senator Coburn's office to include an amendment that would prohibit fee diversion. It went through the Senate successfully. It went over to the House. And we were surprised to find that, and I think the Republican chairman of the House Judiciary Committee, Lamar Smith, and his staff were surprised that then Budget Committee Chairman Ryan the appropriations chairman at the time were opposed to having this fee diversion uh, prohibition included, so much so that the bill wasn't going to make it to the House floor. So we then spent a lot of time with members of Congress that for whom this was one of their big issues, like Dr. Coburn, as well as the PTO, which also cared very strongly about it, as you can imagine, to try to figure out whether there were alternate mechanisms that wouldn't be as solid as the statutory provision that had passed the Senate, but would still be effective in making sure that if the PTO took in more money than it was allowed to spend in a year, because its projections were off in that direction, that it could keep that money and still spend it the next year. And ultimately, I think the compromise that was struck in the House and that we helped with in the Senate has voided fee diversion. It is not as solid as the provision that originally passed the Senate, but it was definitely an interesting dynamic where Senator Leahy, even though he's also a senior member and now a ranking member of the Senate Appropriations Committee, which institutionally is the one that wants to keep control, was a big supporter of making sure that there was a provision to end fee diversion, but then Chairman Ryan was not willing to let that go forward. So was that a turf thing for uh, Chairman Ryan, or was it some ideological reason why? That I don't know, but I'm really glad that we're able to find a compromise to get through it. And it wasn't completely to Dr. Coburn's satisfaction, but I think it did a good job in the so far prevented fees from being diverted, which is a good thing. And I guess something else that is interesting about that is that about how you worked with Dr. Coburn's office to really satisfy him. Is that the kind of thing that happens if, because there's a hundred senators and you imagine each one of them might have an idea about what should be in the bill. Is it really an effort to bring every single senator along to try to make them completely happy if possible? Is that, is that the goal? Yeah. So thinking about it both as wanting to address concerns that other members of Congress have, and one of Senator Leahy's priorities was to be as bipartisan as possible in this process, but you want to do it in a way where you make sure that the changes that you would be making in the legislation were consistent with policy priorities that Chairman Leahy was comfortable with. And nine times out of 10, we were successful in doing it. I think when the bill passed the Senate the first time, I think it was 
91 to 8 or yes, something like that. So by and large, it was successful. We weren't able to address every concern, yeah. and that was true in the House process as well. But often, I know, a member from different states are hearing from different companies and different industry groups, and they're able to bring a perspective that sometimes we hadn't considered before. You see, there's a lot of amendments that went through on the Senate floor when the bill passed the first time. And that was because different senators had different suggestions. And that's the legislative process. They should get votes on amendments, or we should figure out how to incorporate their amendments into a manager's package. And I think that process, both on the Democrat and the Republican side, went very smoothly. And we had a lot of both on the staff and member level, an interest in trying to work together to find solutions. And that's the way that Congress is supposed to work. And that's great to hear. So I guess the bigger lesson to take away from that is if you get the attention of one senator on a relatively minor issue, then chances are once the big bill gets passed, he might have enough influence to really make that. Yeah, change. it's always best if you can get it in the beginning part of the process, yeah. because that gives it the most chance of making it all the way through. But it's never too late to raise issues and members really do want to hear. And it's not like you need the attention of the chairman of the committee or the Senate majority leader or something like that. It's really any one senator can have that kind of influence. Yes. Yes. I mean, they are your elected representative and they will go to the Speaker of the House. They will go to the majority leader of the Senate, the chairman of the Senate uh, Judiciary Committee and raise those on your behalf. And you have to remember that within any state, your view might not be the only (laughs) view. But if those views resonate with your elected representative, they really do that. And we made a lot of changes along the way as a result. Something else, I guess, uh, stuck out to me in the coverage of the final AIA is about how the covered business methods program ended up in there. I guess a lot of the coverage, the short version is Chuck Schumer inserted it on behalf of the big banks in New York. If you read some of the more detailed legislative history, if there's different versions of that, of how that actually happened. From your perspective, how did that special carve-out happen for a specific type of, I guess, innovation? So this is one that actually Senator Schumer and Senator Kyle worked very closely on. It was also a priority for Chairman Smith, I believe. But is trying to figure out what's a way of addressing what they saw as patents that were issued post-State Street that were really just methods of doing business and were done before the PTO had the expertise that it should in that art area in order to weed out bad patents. And they were really broad claiming and how can we figure out a way without just invalidating a category of patents to help weed out some of those patents that were issued during a time period. And that's the reason why it was made to be temporary was because it was really about the post between State Street and Alice time period and It took a lot of compromising to try to figure out how can we make sure that the provision is sufficiently narrow so that it doesn't creep into other industry areas, and how do we make sure that it's not going to last more than the, I think it was five originally and became eight, but that time frame where it's really about weeding out patents that shouldn't have been issued in the first place. But we also spent a lot of time with the PTO trying to work on, can we narrow it further by making sure, for instance, that it can only be used when you've been threatened with lawsuit and different ways to try to cabin in provision because as a general matter, I think for the patent system, we don't want to have provisions that are technology specific and make some forms of inventions more valuable than others and have the government making that choice. I think this was a very special case. Well, I think I'll, we'll talk more about it because I think we obviously <laughs> agree about this issue now, but there were other ways to invalidate these bad patents, obviously. You can just do it through litigation or through the other post-grant proceedings that were created. But from a perception, from that standpoint, where, you know, these big Wall Street banks were obviously, at least in the narrative, they get the special carve-out that, you know, other businesses don't to invalidate patents that they don't want. Was that a concern that, 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 like, in terms of treating everybody equally, treating, you know, not only people, but obviously it is people because some people innovate related to business, some people innovate related to pharmaceuticals, but, you know, from that perspective, is it, do you have any sense? Yeah, so, you know, I think the narratives get spun in different ways. So if the bill at the end of the day didn't have anything that made it easier to challenge what most people would look at and say probably are not valid patents, but they were issued at a time when they were issuable, but they probably wouldn't be anymore, then I think you'd have a narrative of you have all these community banks around the country 
that are facing lawsuits that are patent infringement suits from patents that $500,000 into the lawsuit would be invalidated, but they can't afford to go through that. And so they're going to settle for $100,000. And you have everybody who's processing checks, because one of the patents that was heavily discussed at the time had to do with uh, the Check 21 law. And they are, businesses are going to continue to pay license fees because the amount of money it would cost to invalidate just doesn't make sense. And then that would be the narrative. And now, of course, some people who oppose the provision created a different narrative when the bill was ultimately passed. But it's it's a relatively narrow provision. It was definitely a bipartisan issue. And ultimately, I think as long as it expires the way it's intended to expire, it did invalidate a lot of patents that shouldn't have been issued. And the tech neutrality version of the patent system will continue on after that. I guess there was a lot of different provisions in the AIA. Which part do you think was the most consequential or significant? I think there are two that I usually focus on. One of the changes to the inter-parties re-examination system, creating a post-grant review and an inter-parties review for the difference with an adversarial system rather than an examinational model of review. And the other that I think doesn't get enough attention is the ability to provide and pre-issue and submissions to the PTO and explain why the patent is granted on an ex parte basis, right? And I think um, there's a lot of concern that the quality of patents coming out were not as good as they could be in a lot of art areas, in part because third parties really didn't have an opportunity to provide prior art and explain why the prior art was relevant. And I think by the time the bill got to passage, one of the top uh, objectives for it, one of the things that, that I think it was going to do the best was to try to improve the quality of patents that are in the system. And that can happen by weeding them out in the first nine months through post-grant review, but even better if it happens by improving the information that the examiners have at the outset by encouraging pre-issue and submissions. And I think that objective of improved patent quality and those provisions in particular are important ones. Let's say you magically could have gotten exactly the version of AIA that you thought was best. How would it be different? In what way would it be different from what was passed? That's a good question. I, I think it would look exactly like <laughs> you did. No, I think one of the things that I've learned since implementation of the act is that no matter what words are down on a piece of paper, the way the language gets implemented is what's really important. I think that we've discovered that in the inter-parties review system, where used much more than inter-party re-exam was. It's invalidated a lot more claims than I think people anticipated when it was first passed. There was a lot of criticism at first that it would not be sufficiently usable for challengers. And the way it's been implemented has just been really different. And to me, that just shows that you try to create the right structure, how it's actually going to impact different industries depends on how it's going to be implemented. Right. And it's really hard to identify those ahead of time. It seems that many people, I think you're hinting at it, but many people that were involved with passing AIA, and especially an article by your old colleague, Senator Kyle, struck out to me that he seems that it, he thinks it went too far, especially in terms of maybe how the post-grant proceedings were implemented. And it seems you agree with that in terms of uh, the, some of those issues. Not so much that I think that it's gone too far. I think what's interesting is that it is being used a lot more than and was anticipated when it was passed. So it's just a, it's more of a caution about unintended consequences or not necessarily knowing what the impact is going to be based on what the language of the statute is. What's really important is how, in this case, the PTO goes about implementing it. Okay. And that's got a huge impact. And I guess Director Ianco now is taking some significant steps to change how the AIA was implemented. What do you think about those efforts? So one of the things that we did in working out the inter-party review system when we reached a compromise uh, that was described before with Director Capos and Senator Kyle and a number of other senators and congressmen was to include enough latitude for the PTO to create rules, right? They don't have substantive rulemaking authority as a general matter. That was very controversial in 2005, 2006. But they do have the ability to set rules around the way IPR and PGR work. And there's no way they're going to get it all exactly right the first time. And so I think it makes perfect sense that we continue to try to tweak them to make sure that it, we take unintended consequences out of the system. I think we should be careful about going too far because the usability of IPR in particular to avoid needless litigation costs is important. We want to make sure, as I said earlier on, the goal should be if you have a high quality patent that has 
tightly defined claims and is a true invention, it should be as easy as possible to enforce. Problem is that you know, everybody has a different view as to when something fits that description and where it's more on the line of an overly broad claim where there's prior art that's going to read on it. It's important that there be something less expensive than $500,000 in litigation fees to be able to, to challenge. And so I hope we don't move back too far, but I think we're going to have a constant calibration and it's good that the PTO has that ability to slide it back and forth, to try to make sure we get it right. And we mentioned in your current role at BSA, you have come out against extending the CBM program. I read the fact sheet that BSA put together and I actually found it super convincing. It says, the effect of making it easier to challenge patents in one field of technology is to decrease investment in research and development in the challenged field. The uncertainty CBM creates around protection for cutting edge software, competitiveness in fields such as artificial intelligence, blockchain, and cybersecurity. And you're obviously talking about specifically patents being challenged under CBM, but couldn't you make that same argument about all the post-grant proceedings? Is the fact that the post-grant proceedings make it easier to invalidate all patents really reduce the investment that companies are ready to make? I think it's different because I think that with CBM, one of the issues that concerns us is when you make it easier to challenge one specific technology sector, that's going to shift where investment goes. At the same time, I think you want to make sure that the patent system can't be used in a way that by having overly broad claims, you have the potential to make it significantly harder to launch products and services that we would want to provide the incentive to do. And the ability to have a, an IPR system and a PGR system that cleans up those patents and avoids having patents in the system that are overly broad is really important, provided that it's not just in one technology sector. I wouldn't want to have a separate rule for a chemical compound than we have for any other yes. technology <laughs> sector. It's that kind of disparate treatment that will lead to government-created distortions in investments. Oh, I see. So I guess the concern is about the distortions in terms of... But I guess, and Director Yanko has talked about it, and former Director Kappas, I think, would agree with it. At the very least, there's a perception that, wrongly or rightly, that Patents are easily invalidated these days. And I probably, if you're a small independent business owner who's getting sued for <laughs> patent infringement, you might not agree, but there's at least this perception among the investment in the investment community. Do you disagree with that perception or do you think it's a problem or outweighs? Yeah, we need the to keep we need to keep working towards the balance that says if you have a good quality patent, you can enforce it. And if you have a patent that is of low quality, you're not going to be able to extort rents based on it. And I think 10 years ago, we had the opposite problem. 10 years ago, we had the problem that the perception was if you had a patent, regardless of the merits of it and whether it would withstand scrutiny, you're going to be able to collect $20,000, $50,000, $100,000 at a time because nobody's really going to challenge it. Now, I think the perception has, has shifted back, as you've said, and maybe gone too far the other direction. But trying to get that balance is what's important. And it's not always possible for the legislative text or the statutory text to convey the principle of you have a high quality patent, it's going to be enforceable. And those who are using that technology should be paying a reasonable royalty. But if you're really trying to claim beyond what you invented, you're not going to be able to do that profitably. And I guess I wanted to finish this discussion about the post-grant proceedings about two specific criticisms that exist. One is that the same patent can be endlessly challenged by the same party or by different parties even at the PTO. Do you think that's a problem or, or not? Well, it depends on how it's done. So the system can be misused and the PTO has the rulemaking authority to try to deal with that. On the other hand, if a claim was challenged in an IPR today and 10 years from now the patent is still in the system and there's a company that didn't exist today, but exists 10 years from now and is facing a lawsuit based on that same claim, they should still have the same tools to try to challenge it. Right. So it's just making sure that the IPR system isn't being misused, same way we don't want patents to be misused. Should the same company get a chance to challenge the same <laughs> patent twice? You couldn't challenge the same claim twice. If you failed the first time around, you'd be stopped right. from either bringing an IPR or raising the same prior art. If you weren't aware of the, theoretically, if you weren't aware of the prior art. Well, if you could reasonably yeah. have found it, right? Yeah. So, I mean, 
One of the big issues that was at issue when we created the IPR system was whether to get rid of the or could have raised part of what was in inter-parties re-examination. And it ultimately stayed. We have a modifier, reasonably could have raised. Um, but it's the same standard that it existed before. And it's usually, I believe it is usually interpreted pretty broadly so that if it's, it's in prior art for an IPR challenge has to be in the form of a written publication, usually you can find those at the right, same right. time. Yeah. So I think you make a good point. The company that didn't exist and another company did a bad job of challenging those patents shouldn't, you know, shouldn't suffer because of that. But the second issue is, I guess you've seen the rise of these third-party entities that independently challenge patents. And supposedly they don't work directly with the litigants, but is that a positive development that some third-party entity can, you know, just look around and see what company doesn't like and start challenging their patents. I think the key is to make sure that the standard for two things. One, the standard for successfully challenging a patent and getting it into IPR has to be sufficiently strong. And it is now a higher standard than it was under the inter-party re-examination system. Right? People criticizing the current IPR system often forget that in the inter-party re-examination system, something like 98% of all petitions for inter-party re-exam were granted. And it's lower now. It's still high, but it's lower than that. So I think one thing is to make sure that you have a sufficiently solid reason for beginning an IPR. The other is you want to make sure that there's not collusion that would be improper under the PTO's rules between anybody doing the challenging and, and a litigant. But I think we do want to make sure that all the patents that are in the system are high quality and should have been issued in the first place. And to the extent, particularly in the first window, I think the goal of the first window was to clean up patents as quickly as possible so that the patent owner doesn't rely on the patent grant when the grant shouldn't have been issued in the first place. And it also doesn't deter companies from creating technologies in that area where there really shouldn't have been a patent, but for some reason it got through the system anyway. And I think for third parties to be using that, especially that first window, is probably a good thing provided that the threshold for getting into the system is sufficiently robust. So I guess from what I understand is they're kind of doing a public good regardless of how they get funded in terms of getting rid of bad patents. Doesn't mean that there might not be any unintended consequences yeah. depending on the actual use case, but there's circumstances where I think it does make sense and was part of the, the idea. Okay. So it's not like it was a surprising development that these kind of entities sprung up. Not that there would be entities that would be looking at patents that should not have issued. And, and partly, I mean, we would, at the time that I was working on it, we would hear from public interest groups that were doing that as part of inter-party re-examination. Right. And inter-party re-examinations, while they were all instituted, only two or three, I think, ever went to finality. So there was a concern about just how long it took. And a large part of inter-party review was shortening that time frame and raising the threshold for beginning it. Very interesting. So I guess the, the last big topic that I want to talk about is really BSA itself and really the role of interest groups. And I'm just curious about how they work and how they impact the IP policy process. So BSA was actually started, from what I understand, by Microsoft, but now it's made up of a very diverse set of companies, everything from IBM, DocuSign, to Apple, which seem very different in terms of their IP strategies and the IP issues they face. How do you form a consensus and decide what positions, what IP policy positions to take? Well, our members are primarily enterprise software companies, Microsoft, Apple, DocuSign are three of them. And we work together as new policy issues come up to decide what an industry consensus position would be. Just like in every other industry sector, we're going to have different companies will experience the patent system in slightly different ways. And so we have to have a lot of discussions about where the industry as a whole should be. But we're fortunate that most of our companies are very aligned and have an interest in trying to figure out how do we come to an industry consensus. And then from that, we can take that to the Hill, to the PTO. We file amicus briefs pretty regularly to try to convey a position where I think our, our members have a very balanced perspective on patent issues because when you look at the list of companies that get the most patents every year, BSA members are all up and down it. If you also look at companies that get the most patent infringement suits filed against them, our members will be up and down it. So it's really important to our members that where you have high quality patents, they are enforceable. Where a patent is overly broad, that there's a, an efficient way of challenging it. I don't think if I'm reading into much, but for example, I'm sure IBM get the most patents out of anyone. They have 
some of the biggest patent experts probably in the world working there. So they have very strong views on IP issues. While other members might, you know, they're busy with really other issues. Is your role really educating some of your members about what positions they should be taking, how they're benefiting, or is really just taking inputs and kind of seeing where you could <laughs> reach that agreement, where that intersection took place? It's making sure that we have an open discussion because every company is going to be, every software company is going to be affected by changes in IP policy. Yeah. Some are going to worry about certain aspects more than other aspects. Some are more focused on copyright. Some are more focused on trade secrets, some on patents, but they're all focused on a healthy functioning IP system. So having an open dialogue with them as new issues come up is, I believe, the best way to try to make sure that as an industry association, we're advancing their priorities. There's no one formula, but it's really helpful having companies that really do see both sides of these issues because they experience it on both sides. And does it ever happen when one of your big members changes their strategy or approach to IP issues in a major way and they say, well, all right, I think you guys should take a different position now? Or is it really, do they give you the leeway to kind of figure out what the best position is for all your members? I don't think there's ever a 180 degree or a 90 degree turn. I think the industry continues to evolve. As it evolves and different issues become important for different reasons, then the industry changes in terms of how it's experiencing the patent system or the copyright system or trade secrets. And then because we're having constant conversations, that will help inform where as an industry association we should be and how we can be best supporting the continued growth of the industry. And my sense, I guess, is that BSH tries to really find the balanced position or at least portray that the position is kind of a reasonable compromise between the different positions that are out there. It really is the objective. I and mean, I think one of the things that when I was on Capitol Hill, I appreciated about BSA and BSA members was that they were solution oriented. So they might not experience the same problem that another company had brought to our attention, and they might not agree with that specific solution, but they would try to work with us to figure out what's another way of accomplishing the objective without having the unintended consequences on the software industry. And that's what I think we do now and what I think is the right way of approaching the PTO and Congress. And I guess another trade group that a lot of people come across when they're looking into patent issues is CCIA. And to an outside observer, they represent a bunch of technology companies and you guys represent a bunch of technology companies, but they seem to take a much more extreme anti-patent view on every issue. I mean, one is I'm almost surprised that their members are comfortable with that kind of approach. But from your perspective, I guess, like being Capitol Hill, is that effective or do they just play a different role in that ecosystem? Look, every different industry association has a different role to play in the advocacy sphere. What I've always thought BSA's role was is to try to help find those kind of solutions. But it shouldn't ignore that on both sides of the issue, whether you're on the what we consider the pro-patent or the anti-patent side, there are strongly held views based on experience of different companies that make them want to be pushing really hard in one direction or the other. I think that's an important role to play. I think what we bring to the table and what we try to do is try to recognize that different companies and different industries have different experiences with the patent system and try to figure out what a solution is that can try to help with that problem without having a, a larger negative impact on the system. Is it fair to think, well, this trade group is taking this position, so this member supports this position? Or is that not really a fair? I think almost all associations are big enough that it's hard to draw that conclusion. Yeah. Certainly here, I can say that we try to make sure that we are driving a consensus that's our objective, but different companies are gonna have you know, different nuances to, to how they view an issue. And fortunately, they, they also engage directly with members of Congress and, and the administration, and I think that's important. One last question about trade groups. I, at least I find it interesting when trade groups file briefs to try to influence the courts. Another something interesting that I've noticed, for example, the David Oil States was argued there were full page ads in the Wall Street Journal about patents and stuff. Is there a strategy that trade groups are thinking about, about trying to influence the judges or the clerks in some kind of, not just by filing briefs, by other... <laughs> I don't know about advertisements. It's not yeah. something that we did. But we do file briefs and we do it in large part because I think it's important for the justices or the federal circuit to hear how we believe a certain outcome is going to affect 
the software industry in our case. And I think it's important when bio does it and pharma does it and other groups do it. I think it is helpful for the court to know that, that it's not just the litigants that are going to be affected and they should have a sense as to how it's going to affect the broader ecosystem. And so we've been doing that, with, particularly on IP cases, for a long time. A lot of our companies are very focused on privacy and cybersecurity and AI today. And so that, that's been a lot of our focus recently. But we have historically, including in oil states, filed amicus briefs because I think it's important to give a full industry perspective. And do you try to be selective about it in terms of, we'll just file in this one case so they know we're serious? Or is it kind of, do you really want to make your views known on all the major issues? No, we're definitely selective. And largely it has to do with which cases appear like they will have a really significant impact across the ecosystem. Yes. Getting rid of all possible post-issuance proceedings would have a real serious effect on our companies, even though our companies are some of the biggest patent holders because they're also who care about making sure they can efficiently challenge patents that shouldn't have been issued that are asserted against them. So we try to choose cases, patentability cases, where we think it's going to have a significant impact on the industry. So I guess one, and you mentioned the Innovation Act, but I wanted to touch upon, obviously there's a lot of changes in leadership on the House side and the Senate side. There's a new <laughs> judiciary chairman and ranking member. I guess before we get to the specific bills, do you have any views about Chairman Nadler, about what his approach will be to IP issues, about Collins and so forth, I guess, Lindsey Graham? And yeah, I'd say, you know, with, with Chairman Nadler and ranking member Collins, they were both with the IP subcommittee and have a lot of experience in IP issues. We've worked with both of them for a long time. I was fortunate to work with them in a previous capacity on trade secrets bill. Ranking member Collins did a great job as, as um, the majority at that point to try to get it turned into law. I think they are both really experienced in, in IP policy and have had a lot of achievements under their belt. I'd say with Chairman Graham and Senator Feinstein, who's now the ranking member, they're also we worked very closely with them on a number of issues, but including IP for a lot of years and including the Defend Trade Secrets Act. So I, I think you have a lot of experience there and a lot of people who work well together and listen to all industry perspectives. So I think we work well with them, but it's not like you know, there, there are a lot of industries that they are very good about making sure that they are reaching out to, that they hear from. And so I, I think you know, it's going to take a little time for them to um, start legislating because we have a lot of other things going on in Capitol Hill at the moment before they legislate on IP. But I think that we'll definitely see activity this Congress because they've all got experience in the area. It's funny you mentioned there's a lot going on. I, I forgot to ask you about the AIA. Obviously, you know, the Judiciary Committee, it's seen as one of the most partisan committees because of judicial confirmations. And yet, you know, Senator Leahy was able to work with all these different Republican ranking members to advance the AIA. Can you talk a little bit about the dynamic and then how do you see that dynamic coming into play with, obviously, Chairman Nadler says he's going to be focused on investigations of the Trump administration. Is it realistic to expect anything getting done on the IP front with that all of that? Yeah, I think one of the great things about IP issues is that they are not partisan at all. Nobody has ever won an election based on their stance on IP issues. But just because they're not partisan doesn't mean they're political. The way the IP system is experienced in Georgia is going to be different than New York and South Carolina is going to be different than California. But the, um, the ability to work across party lines is what makes IP bills successful and, and viable. Um, and it's also, I think, one of the things that members of Congress enjoy about IP bills is the ability to work across party lines when you're going to be fighting tooth and nail on something else to be able to have some issues where uh, you're just trying to solve problems. That's interesting, uh, yeah. <laughs> and, and I think that, that that's You never think about that, but that's an interesting uh, conversation. I know you mentioned the Innovation Act, and then that's actually trying to get additional, quote-unquote, patent reform. And then on the flip side, you have Senator Coons and Senator Conan introducing the Stronger Act to kind of maybe dial back some of the reforms in the post-grant proceedings. Where do you see either one of those bills going anywhere? Is there any compromise between those? It seems completely different directions. Well, one of the things that they do, I think, is they help prompt conversations. And one of the, we talked earlier about the difficulty sometimes in getting different industries and companies focused on patent issues when they've got a hundred other things that they need to focus on. In introducing legislation, one of the things that it does is it gets companies to come in and express their views and explain why they think a uh, bill is either the best thing in the world or the worst thing in the world or 
somewhere in the middle. And I think the introduction of those bills has had that effect over the last couple of Congresses. When the, during the AIA process, there was uh, almost always a Senator Kyle bill that was sort of similar to where Senator Coons is, in addition to the patent reform bill, until they finally were able to come together and figure out which pieces we could put together that would accomplish everyone's objectives. I guess the other big development that you, you are hearing about in the Hill that I was surprised to hear right after the election is that at least Senator Coons is making some efforts to work out, to look into working out some possible solution with regards to patent eligibility issues. At least my reading into where the BSA stands, that's something they'd like to fix as well. Is, do you see those efforts going anywhere anytime soon? I think the language of 101 has stayed the same for a long time, yeah. and the level of concern from different industries has changed over time based on court interpretation, right? So I think that there are just a lot of different views as to whether changing the way eligibility works through statute is either achievable or advisable versus trying to figure out if there's a way of the PTO continuing to make sure that they are taking the best parts of, of case law that's come out right. you know, and, and working through it until we get to a point where patents that, that should be issued are and those that shouldn't or not. I think it's good that there's a lot of focus on it. Legislation around it is complex. And it's interesting you hear about the important role that the PTO can play, but do you think the courts will quote-unquote, trust the PTO more to make that judgment with regards to patent eligibility? No, I, I think it's more that as new cases come before district court, the federal circuit, the Supreme Court, they'll continue to work out the contours of what it's supposed to mean and what should be excluded and what shouldn't be excluded. And it needs to be an iterative process. And you can change the statute today and you're still going to have interpretation problems. So I, I think one constructive way of looking at it is if the PTO continues to work on it and grants patents that as a community, we all think that they should, then those will be the cases before the courts and we'll continue to see improvement in the sense that everybody will have clarity about what's patentable and what's not. I guess, I don't know if you heard about this theory, but there's a theory out there that maybe the Supreme Court will get rid of the judicial exceptions altogether under the influence of Gorsuch and Kavanaugh. Do you think that's realistic to kind of prompt any kind of action on Capitol Hill? I haven't been, but the next time somebody asks, I'll be able to say yes. Okay. <laughs> All right, great. Um, two last substantive questions before we get to the hopefully fun questions. Besides what we discussed, any predictions about any major IP developments that aren't being you know, tracked, appreciated by the tech or IP community that you can think of? Well, one of the things that we focused a lot on that's uh, outside the patent sector is on the ability to do machine learning by being able to take text and data, and some of which will be copyrighted and some of which isn't, and make sure that you can analyze it. And in the U.S., it's not a problem. There's a big debate over this in the EU and, okay. and, and in other places overseas, and Japan's amended its law in a really positive way to make sure that machine learning is possible. Singapore is moving in the same direction. So that's a big IP issue that, while it's not uh, front and center in the U.S., around the world is, a, is an important one. And do you think the U.S. government should be playing a bigger role in trying to influence those other? No, I think, I think they're doing a good job. I think the U.S. law is good on it, but it's just for an industry and for a country that's focused on making sure that we can develop artificial intelligence and that we are continue to be global leaders, that we have a, a good system around the world that facilitates it. Are there any IP policy issues that you think you as lawmakers should be paying more attention to? Um, no, I don't have any right okay. now. All right, so two last questions, hopefully fun ones. What advice would you give to a young lawyer who wants to become the next Aaron Cooper? Uh, well, there's some aspects of that that, are, that might be a good idea and others that probably aren't. <laughs> but I think for people who are interested in doing policy, I think one thing that I've found really helpful is just reaching out to folks on the Hill. I got a bunch of cold calls from lawyers, some of them patent lawyers, who are just interested in in how to try to break onto the Hill and try to do policy work. And uh, I made sure that I sat down with anybody who was interested. And I think that's a really good way of trying to get a sense as to what folks do on Capitol Hill. Is that something you want to do? What happens in the advocacy community? Is that something you want to do? But I think that don't be afraid to reach out to people. I did a lot of that as I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do in the policy space. That's great advice. The last question is, if you didn't follow your career path, is there any other career path that you think you might have liked to pursue? Well, I'd really like to be an astronaut. There are a hundred reasons why that wasn't realistic, but that seems to me something that would be an exciting career. 
well, maybe with the way innovation is going, that will be realistic soon. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. <laughs>